Hi, this is Mr. Dorner reading the, the graphic novel, Louis Armstrong, Jazz Legend. Chapter 1, The Great Satchmo, Bath of Israel Hospital, New York City, March 1969. Louis's condition is serious, Mrs. Armstrong, his heart is weak, and I'm worried about his kidney damage. He's got to start taking better care of himself, Lucille. Louis has to slow down. He isn't a young man anymore. Now, Dr. Zucker, you know how stubborn Louis can be. His whole life and soul centers on singing and blowing that horn. Written by Louis Armstrong, ill in his hospital bed. I was born in New Orleans in a little street called Jane Alley, sometimes called James Alley. James Alley lies in the very heart of what is called the battlefield because the toughest characters in town used to live there. Ever since I was a small kid, I have always been a great observer. Of course, on one cold New Year's Eve in 1912, I should have been watching closer. Please, mister, don't arrest me. I won't do it no more. Please, let me go back to Mama. Chapter 2. Lewis's Life Begins I was taken to juvenile court and then locked up. Louis Armstrong? Yes, sir. You're being sent to the Colored Waifs Home for Boys. During the New Year's Eve celebration, I had fired my stepfather's pistol over and over into the air. Making noise for the New Year was an old custom in New Orleans, but not, it seemed, for a 12-year-old colored boy on a public street. The Waifs Home was in the country near a big dairy farm. I, being a city boy, had never seen anything like it. Captain Jones, who ran things, was a strict man. He drilled his military style every morning. Sound off! One, two! Sound off! Three, four! Mr. Alexander taught the boys how to do carpentry, how to garden, and how to build campfires. Never saw on the line, cut next to the line to leave material for trimming and finishing. Mr. Peter Davis taught us music. At first, I did not get on very well with Mr. Davis because he did not like the neighborhood I came from. The little brass band was very good, and Mr. Davis made the boys play a lot of every kind of music. I would sit in the corner and listen, enjoying myself immensely. Six months passed, and then one day he asked, Louis Armstrong, how would you like to join our brass band? Mr. Davis got me started out on the tambourine, then the bugle, and finally, a few weeks later, the cornet. I also learned to play drums. I got so good at playing the cornet that one day, you're going to be the leader of the band, Louis. The band often got a chance to play at the private picnic or join one of the frequent parades throughout the streets of New Orleans. Chapter 3. Starting. I was 14 when I was let go from the home. Part of me didn't want to leave. I'll never forget what you've done for me, Mr. Davis. Keep up with your music, son. You've made a fine start. But I was lucky. I soon found a job on a coal cart for a Russian Jewish immigrant family, the Karnovskys. Stone coal, nickel a bucket. On a good day, I'd earned 75 cents, free and clear, to help my family pay, pay the bills. I don't know what would have happened to me without the help of those kind people. Ninety-five and a nickel makes one dollar. But Papa Karnovsky, that's too much money. Use what's left to buy yourself a horn. How are you going to practice your music if you don't have an instrument? I want to start performing. My friend Buddy Martin said he might have something for me. My boss is looking for a cornet player. Isn't that what you play? Yes, but I don't know if I'm good enough to play in a regular band. Buddy got a gig for me, but now I needed a horn. Most of the money I earned went to help my folks. Still, with Papa Karnowski's help, I had scraped together about $10. I looked high and low for a horn, but even the saddest ones were priced too high. This was my last stop. I had money in my pocket to spend at the price is right. Maybe just maybe my luck would change. How much is this horn, mister? Fifteen dollars. But it's all dented. Plays just as good with the dents as without. He was right. The little horn was nothing to look at. It sounded just fine. Thanks for letting me see it, sir, but I've only got ten dollars. Ten bucks, eh? Pawn shop owner must have seen how much I wanted that horn. First night I worked, I made fifteen cents. I spent my nights making music, but I didn't give up my coal wagon job either. And I was still learning the musician's trade. When I wasn't playing, I was listening to other musicians. You sounded great tonight, Joe. Thanks, kid. Joe Oliver has always been my inspiration and my idol. When Joe would get through playing, I'd carry his horn. Joe gave me cornet lessons. No, Satchel Mouth, try holding your lips like this. Everyone called me Satchel Mouth, which was later shortened to Satchmo. Some people think they were making fun of me, but I disagree. My so-called big mouth allowed me to play longer and better. It helped me with my singing, too. Years passed, and I kept improving. I even became a member of the Tuxedo Brass Band. Everyone wanted to hear me play. I had many regular gigs, including with orchestras for steamboats on the Mississippi River. No, one, no more hauling coal for nickels. Those days were over. Joe Oliver left New Orleans in 1918 and was now up in Chicago doing real swell. In 1922, he invited me to join his Creole Jazz Band. I wouldn't have left New Orleans for anybody but Papa Joe Oliver. My opening night at the Lincoln Gardens Dance Hall was magic. I felt like I was home. We cracked down on the first note, and that band sounded so good to me. The first number went down. So well, we had to take an encore. After the floor show was over and they went into some dance tunes, the crowd yelled, Let the youngster blow! 
I had hit the big time. I was up north with, my, with the greats. I was playing with my idol, the King Joe Oliver. My boyhood dream had come true at last. But I wasn't cut out to be a band leader. I wanted to play the music, not be the boss. And that was Louis Armstrong with his Hot Five uh, with the jazz number West End Blues. I stayed in Chicago and did a lot of radio shows. I even made it to Broadway in an all-black musical review called Hot Chocolates. I ended up recording one of my favorite songs in the show, Ain't Misbehavin' by Fats Waller, became my best-selling record. No one to talk with all by myself. No one to walk with, but I'm happy on a shelf. Ain't misbehavin'. You should listen to the original. He does it better than me. I also spent some time in California making movies such as Pennies from Heaven with Bing Crosby. When the skeleton in the closet started to dance. In 1948, I appeared on Ed Sullivan's Talk of the Town television show for the first time. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Louis Armstrong. All through the 1930s and 40s, I watched jazz grow in popularity. People of all kinds were interested in hearing the music. In 1949, I became the first jazz musician ever to appear on the cover of Time magazine. Old Satchmo on the cover of Time. I still can't believe it. It seems the country is becoming more accepting of who you were. The color of your skin didn't seem as important. Still, a lot of people felt differently. One night in 1957, I was playing a concert in Knoxville, Tennessee. The group was wailing on Back of Town Blues when the entire theater shook. Some fools from the White Citizens Council tossed a stick of dynamite at the theater. Guess they didn't like having a black and white audience watching my show together, even if they were segregated. Luckily, no one was hurt. That's all right, folks. It's just the phone. I always kept raced out of my music, but I believed in the civil rights music, or civil rights movement. Later that year, in an attempt to desegregate Little Rock, Arkansas, I finally said my piece. My people are just looking for anything. We just want a square shake. But when I see on television and read about the crowd with Arkansas spitting on a little color girl, I think I have some right to get sore. I think President Eisenhower listened. The National Guard has sent 1,200 National Guardsmen to escort the nine colored students to Central High School in, here in Little Rock. In 1960, I toured Africa as part of a four-month trip sponsored by the State Department. I was carried into the stadium in the Congo like a visiting king. I even stopped the Civil War for a day. Both sides in the Congo crisis called a temporary truce to hear me perform. Toward the end of 1963, my manager gave me a song to record from a new high Broadway musical. To be honest, I didn't think much of the tune. I sang it, played a horn solo, and then forgot about it. Well, hello, Dolly. It's so nice to have you back where you belong. Again, you should listen to the original. On May 9, 1964, Hello, Dolly went to number one on the charts. I knocked the Beatles down to number two. A few years later, I was singing the song to Miss Barbara Streisand in the movie Hello, Dolly. I was busier than ever, and that was okay with this cat. People are quick to forget you if you don't keep your name before the public. Chapter 5, What a Wonderful World, Beth Israel Hospital, New York City, March 1969. I think I've had a beautiful life so far. Louis, are you sleeping? I never wished for anything I couldn't get, and I got pretty near everything I wanted because I worked for it. I don't care about anyone's personal lives, I'm just interested in the music. Just want to say that music has no age. Most of your great composers, musicians, are elderly people. Way up there in age, they will live forever. As long as you're still doing something interesting and good, you are in the business as long as you're breathing. There's no such thing as on the way out. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Louis Armstrong continued to give performances around the world. In March 1971, he played a final two-week series of shows at the Waldorf Astoria in New York City. On July 6, 1971, the great Satchmo died peacefully in his sleep. Satchmo's Legacy Over to the left is the glossary. It's got a lot of different things. Uh, most of the things you probably know. Um, I think Pawn Shop you're probably familiar with. Um, over on the right, the only reason I include this last slide, all of these graphic novels are pretty interesting. I think Jackson has read all of them, and they're all really in this overview of a lot of these different people. Um, so if you have a chance to check these out, they're really nice. They're about a lot of people that you wouldn't normally read about, like you probably heard of Harry Houdini, but maybe don't know anything about them. Um, certainly heard of Malcolm X, but maybe don't know a lot about them. So check them out. Here is your question for the day. What is one thing that you heard about from Louis Armstrong's life that you can totally relate to? What is one thing you heard about from Louis Armstrong's life that you have no idea how to relate to because it's so foreign to your experience? Answer those questions in either 
an email to Mr. Dorner, share a Google document, or if you prefer, give me the answer in a video and send that along. Good luck.